The Too Tall Sports Podcast is brought to you by no one. But maybe after this episode, we can get somebody. We got a big guest today, literally big, six foot seven, just like me. Uh, SoCal guy, he went to Long Beach State, just like me. You know, we got a lot in common. So I had to bring him on the show. He's hilarious. You can find him on Twitter at Locate Jared. Uh, his name is Jared Hughes. He's a relief pitcher for the Mets right now. Spent time with the Pirates, Reds, and Milwaukee Brewers. He's been in the league for almost 10 years now. So good to track him down. I think you guys really like this episode. Uh, we talk about his upbringing. We talk about the science of pitching, what it's like to go from a starter to a reliever, and all the funny stories in between. So um, as always, you can find the show at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's T-O-O, Tall Sports Podcast. Um, you can find me on YouTube, Spotify. Please subscribe, rate, and review. Always, we're on Apple Podcasts as well. That's the easy one. But uh, let me know what you think about the episode, and I hope you enjoy my show today and interview with Jared Hughes. Welcome back to the Too Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a relief pitcher for the New York Mets. He's been in the big leagues for almost pretty much 10 years now, so it went by really quick. Uh, we both played in the Pirates organization a few years ago, and he was drafted by Pittsburgh in the fourth round uh, in the 2006 draft. And we're also uh, both former Long Beach State dirtbags, too, so we got a connection there. And we're both six feet seven, so we're also very large human. <laughs> and he's an Orange <laughs> County guy. So, of course, I had to bring on uh, my old buddy, Jared Hughes. What's up, man? How you doing? What's up, Brett? You know, I'm, I might be – I'm like uh, – you definitely have me beat. You're definitely taller than I am. I, I say I'm 6'7", but it's typically in cleats. But, okay. uh, All right. But, yeah, man, <laughs> I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, definitely. I got a lot to get to with you, but I want to start with your, your upbringing a little bit. Um, I didn't know you were actually born in Connecticut. When did you move down to SoCal, for, and how many years did you spend there? Yeah, I'm a SoCal guy. I, I lived yeah. in Connecticut for two years. Oh, I get okay. I get asked that a lot about that now that I'm with the Mets because Stanford, Connecticut's close by. But I lived there for two years and grew up in uh, San Marino by Pasadena. Moved to Orange County for high school. Went to Long Beach State. So I'm I'm a Cali guy, man. That's where that's where my heart's at. There you go. Exactly. And you know, being tall like we are, did I, I'm sure people were trying to make you play basketball. And kind of, did you ever think about playing when you were younger, or did you play in high school at all? My dream was to be an NBA guy. You probably might have had Hell the yeah. same dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to be like, I wanted to be like the next Los Angeles Lake or whatever I wanted. I didn't want to like baseball. I enjoyed basketball. I really loved. Uh, and then I got really good at baseball and I didn't get good at basketball. I couldn't shoot. I couldn't dribble. I couldn't run. I was no good. So it turned out that uh, it's a lot more fun to play a sport when you're really good at it. I'm sure you know that as well. So yeah, it was, it, baseball was my calling. That was it because I was really good at it. Okay. I, I hear you. Yeah. Same thing for me, pretty much. Yeah. It's, uh, it's good yeah. to play a sport you're good at. <laughs> um, as far as when you were coming up in high school for baseball, you know, did you be, were you a full-time pitcher, you know, pretty young or when did you kind of solidify that you were going to be a, a guy moving forward as a pitcher? Yeah. P pitching was always something I did and it was always a lot of fun for me. I, I, I was a hitter as well. I, I won the little league batting title. A lot of people don't know that about me. I won the little league batting title. <laughs> But my dad was the scorekeeper, so I think maybe it might have been a little rigged. He'll say it's not, but I think there was just a bunch of uh, ground balls that might have been errors that wound up being called hits. So uh, I had that. I, w I think I won the league batting title with zero home runs also. <laughs> a lot, not very much barreled contact. But hey, uh, You're a singles hitter. You just get on base. Yeah. yeah. But pit pitching-wise, I always had a decent arm. Uh, I just remember one day I was playing catch or I was fielding balls in the outfield with my dad in Little League, and I threw one to home plate. I was like, whoa, man, like I got a pretty good arm. Like that's pretty cool. So I tried pitching, and I was good at it. And I got like really, really good at it later in high school and then realized that, okay, if I put a lot of time into this, and it's something that I might be able to do at a professional level. I actually had a coach tell me, he said, Jared, as a six foot seven center, do you think you're going to make it to the NBA? <laughs> but as a six foot seven pitcher, you've got a you've got a real good shot at making it to the major leagues. So Tip Lefevre is that coach's name, and Tip is Jim Lefevre's brother. It's a baseball family, and Tip really helped me out with that advice. Great, great advice, right there. You made the right decision, man. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that you you were drafted by the at the time Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Was there any consideration for you to sign out of high school? Yeah, there was, but before the draft, but I got hurt my senior year. 
So there ended up not really being much interest by the Devil Rays. Not the Rays. That not ages Rays. me. When I tell right? my buddies, I'm like, yeah, I got drafted by the Devil Rays, not the Rays. Right. It, age, it ages me. But I think that uh, it, there was no interest there. Okay. They were like, they, they would have signed me, had a few top picks, not signed. But I don't think there was ever even any money talked about. Okay. And so you end up, it looked like you went to Santa Clara for one year yeah. and then ended up transferring uh, back to, to Long Beach State. What kind of went into the decision of, you know, or, you know, were you pretty dead set when you, you like Santa Clara, you thought that was going to be your spot. And I did something similar to transferring back to Long Beach state. What went into that, that decision? Yeah. Santa Clara was uh, going to be a place where I could start it, and they, and I good, a good education and everything kind of lined up. They, they were going to give me a big scholarship. So I thought it was a great opportunity. So I went to Santa Clara in, in hopes of being like their guy, their starter. I got hurt. I didn't do well in school. I was in a bad place, just uh, just being away from my family. And I just, it wasn't good. So I, I transferred out and it was a tough transfer. I actually had to sit out a series, my first series at Long Beach State because the transfer didn't go through the way we thought it did. And I had to go back to the NCAA and reappeal for the transfer. And I just remember Coach Weathers at Long Beach State helping me out a ton with that and ending up, I was eligible to play for the rest wow. of that season. That's pretty crazy. And you, yeah. So what, what was yours? Where did you go first year? I was at U of A, Arizona for two years and then transferred okay. back to Long Beach State. But I had to do it before that sit out a year rule came into play. So that yeah, 07 too. summer. Yeah. For me, it was the 07 summer. And it was like yep. I had to make a move. But um, one of the reasons I went there, just like you, probably to get some more draft stock, you know, boost that and more exposure for pitching. Um, and you went to a, a pretty good team. You know, you, there were some studs there already. What do you remember about your, your year or two at Long Beach State? At Long Beach, I remember it being a lot like professional baseball. Bas basically, you go out there every day, and uh, Troy Buckley and Mike Weathers had a professional baseball environment at the field. So you do something similar to what you do at spring training or in instructional league. So when we would practice, I just, I just remember, you know, you'd go through everything. You'd run fundamental drills extremely well. Everybody would work hard. And when I got to professional baseball, I remember the same thing. I remember it being not much of a change and everything we were doing was something I'd already done. So we obviously, we've had a lot of success of guys coming out of Long Beach State and transferring well into professional baseball. And I thought it was because we could, we could do that. We could do that life, that day-to-day, uh, -day going out there, working hard and finding a way to improve lifestyle. Right. And you end up getting drafted by Pittsburgh in the fourth round. I'm sure yeah. that was a, a big moment for you. What do you remember about the whole draft experience or leading up to where you thought you might go or which team you really thought you might have gone to? Was there any of that going on before the draft? There was a bunch. I mean, a bunch of teams were interested. I, I didn't know exactly where I'd wind up in the draft. I knew that it would be probably somewhere like before round 10, uh, not as high as round two. Like, okay. So I figured that I'd be kind of somewhere where I fell. I know. I think my 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 parents probably thought I was going to be higher than that. My my all my family thought like, oh, he could be a first rounder, but that's not how it worked out. I, I had had some conversations with scouts that were pretty much pretty realistic about it. So right. fourth round to the Pirates, and it was uh, a good opportunity that I jumped on. And the scout that drafted me, Brad Cameron, he said, and he might have drafted you too, did he? No, no, I got drafted else. by Seattle. And then oh, that's to right. Pittsburgh. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. My bad. No, uh, good. but Brad, Brad said, Hey dude, whatever you or Hey Jared, whatever you do, just try to find a way to stay healthy because so many people, it's so hard to stay healthy in baseball. If you can do whatever you can to stay healthy, you'll have a chance of making it if you're lucky. So I just, I, that was my main thing my whole way. It still is. It's a hundred percent true. And every year there's a new crop of yeah. draft picks coming in, you know, they're trying to take your job and it's, it's competitive. You can get forgotten really easily. Actually, that's right. funny you bring that up. I like the, the phrase going from prospect to suspect because that yeah. does happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I live that life, man. I know. Right? Did you live that life? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I had, a, yeah. I had a hip surgery back when we were at the Pirates together, that put me out for almost a year. Like, it definitely can happen. So, it sucks, right. you know. Um, yeah. How was your first couple of years? I saw you went to go play in Hickory and Williamsport. Like, the difference of, you know, you're playing at Blair Field and then you know, like you were saying, it is a professionally run college program, but when you get to minor league ball, you know, you're going against wood bats. It's a little bit different. You're in somewhere across the country. How was that er the early years of minor leagues for you? It was good. It was a learning experience. I didn't do very well. I, I had success right away because I think the hitters weren't used to wood bats that were coming out of college. And then I kind of, I hit a wall uh, and I hit a wall for like five years. 
It was not good. <laughs> I didn't have I didn't have a whole lot of success in the minor leagues all the way yeah. through Double A. Um, and it, I remember one year in A ball in High A in Lynchburg, Virginia. I spent the whole off season training like crazy. I lost a bunch of or but like a bunch of weight. I got super muscular and strong and in shape, and I could run really well. And I showed up to spring, and I had an okay spring. Then I started off the year one and six with a seventy RA in like eight starts, and I was just like in a like in the worst place possible baseball wise thinking that it was like, Oh man, I just, I just did everything wrong. I worked hard. Why didn't it pay off? But baseball is not always like that. Just because you work hard doesn't mean you're going to be good. That's true. You probably had yeah. just to get used to, to pro ball a little bit or, you know, working on your mechanics or whatever. And, you know, in 20, I saw in 2010, you know, you're still, you're a starter at that point still. You hadn't even transitioned right. to a reliever yet, but you had a good year from what it looked like when you were in Altoona in double A. I think you had 12 wins. Did you feel like, all right, now maybe I've turned the corner. I'm going to be a guy soon because I'm getting close. Well, I did, but check this yeah. out. I had 12 wins, but at the all-star break, I had 10. Oh, and I didn't okay. make the all-star team, but I was 10-0, and 0 and I was dominating. Like, Whoa. I thought I would be an all-star for sure. sure. And then the month of July, I, I had, like, five losses. And in one outing, I gave up five home runs and three innings to the Akron Arrows at the time. And, I, and that was my last start that season. And after, like, a, just a incredible first half, and then I go – I have a terrible July, and I give up that five-run outing. And I remember sitting in, like, in like a corner in Akron, Ohio, just thinking, like, okay, well, I guess that's it for me in terms of starting. I got to try to do this bullpen thing now, see how that works. Did you, did you at like, cause I know I got to a point where I don't care what's going to get me up there, whatever role it is, I'll do that. Did you, were you really right. holding on to being a starter or you were just like, you know what? I'm willing to try this bullpen role if it's going to get me to the big leagues. I said those exact words yeah. to our manager when, they, when he said, Hey, we're going to put you in the bullpen. I said, whatever the team needs, I'm, I'm here to do whatever it gets me to the major leagues and whatever helps us win here. Right. So I was upset because I, I thought I could be a starter and that was my life dream. But at the same time, as long as I was still having an opportunity to throw a baseball, I was right. happy. Right. And well, the crazy thing was, you know, not like not a, a negative thing, but you had thrown a decent amount of wild pitches in your career, I saw. I yeah. the Wikipedia page. But then yeah. you go from that guy to you're a, one of the most solid relievers in the big leagues. Did you, was it mechanical? Was it mental? Like, how did you go from where you were in the minors to the kind of reliever you are now? It was, it was a little bit of everything. I think it was mostly mental though, because I, I did okay that the, the end of 2010 out of the bullpen in Altoona, but then yeah. I started off the next year as a swing guy in Altoona for my fourth season in Altoona. And it was, that was double a, and I was almost 26 going in double a. So it was kind of like time. Like I was an organizational type guy. I barely made the fifth spot in the rotation. The Pirates said they might not have a spot for me anymore. And then uh, in June, two guys got hurt in triple a. And they, I was the oldest guy in double A in the, in the bullpen or on the pitching staff. So they called me up just because I was older and I did terrible. I did really bad. My first outing there, I gave up like two or three runs in a third or two thirds of an inning. And I thought that I was probably it. I thought I was going to get released. And uh, my bullpen, my, one, of my, one of my catchers or one of our catchers, Chris Watts, you probably remember. Yeah, Chris. I remember him. Yeah, he's, he's living in uh, NorCal now. He's oh, okay. uh, doing investment banking. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Chris, Chris told me, he said, dude, you should just sprint in and try to throw every pitch as hard as you can and see how it goes for you, man. This might be your last outing. Why not go out there and just see what you got? So I did. I, the next time I got an opportunity, 10 days later or something like that, I sprinted in like crazy and I just grunted every pitch and I was throwing like 92 to 94, way harder than I had before. And, uh, and I, I dominated and I kept doing it for two months and I was in the big leagues. That is, I was going to ask you about that story because that's pretty insane. Yeah. So how, was it just like the mentality of sprinting into the bullpen? Because, you know, people will probably laugh when they see, like sometimes when they see that, they, hey, what is this guy doing? Like nobody really does that. You know, there's a couple guys and I saw, you know, a little bit of fast forward here, but like that guy, Todd Coffey used to do it with the Reds and like Keith right. Bell used to sprint in and slide or whatever, right? in front. Sometimes like just guys will do random stuff. What did it do for you mentally though? Did that give you a different edge when you came in the game? It was twofold. I think it mentally made me more aggressive and like I was out of breath. So I couldn't overthink everything, anything. And I had to just grip it and rip it and go. And also it like fired up my heart rate. So I was actually in a better place to perform. And I think that might be why I started throwing harder. And then me being in an aggressive mindset made me just a better pitcher. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. How often do you thank Chris for that? 
You know, every time I give an interview, I, I mention his name, okay. and every time I see him, I, I do thank him. I mean, That's without cool. without him, uh, without him, I would have been uh, probably done, honestly. Okay. Wow. That's pretty. Yeah. That's an amazing story, man. Um, and yeah. we got to talk about speaking of running into the bullpen, we got to talk about one of your nicknames. <laughs> what was yeah. the origin of the nickname, the ostrich? In so at Long Beach State, I would run poles in the outfield of the practice field. And, uh, and to, Troy Tulowitzki was the shortstop there and he would see me running and I kind of have funny form and he goes, you look like an ostrich when you run. Hey, ostrich. Oh, so God. from then on, that was one of my nicknames. I've had a bunch of nicknames though, man. I've had uh, spaghetti is, was one of my nicknames in a ball because I, when I do an inside move, which is a pick off to second right. base, obviously, you know, but when I do an inside move, I call it the spaghetti move. Have you heard that before? Yeah. See, it's a California thing. <laughs> it is. It's a California, but no one else knew that. So right. then my nickname was Spaghetti okay. uh, because that's what I called that pickoff move. I've had some other good ones, though. The Robot, because I do a good robot impersonation. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> dude, that, I actually saw you do yeah. that in an interview. That reminds me of Grandma's Boy. The dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. J, is it J, 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 JP? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a genius. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, I'm trying to think of other good nicknames I've had. I've had some other ridiculous ones. Mad Dog. My nickname right now is Mad Dog. I considered coming out to Who Let the Dogs Out, but I did a fan poll and they didn't win. What did they? What won for that? Uh, the BTS. It's a K-pop group. BTS style. Oh yeah. So it's really a great song. Yeah. <laughs> you, you should. Hey, if, if you post this, uh, I know we're doing a recording. Yeah. But if you were to post the video we're doing on Zoom right now to uh to youtube and hashtag bts you might get some extra likes yeah. <laughs> Dude, maybe i can get like five million they got like crazy amount of fans don't they right because yeah. they're the greatest group ever to of exist and their <laughs> their music no their music is incredible so i'm okay. very very lucky to I'll have, have to it as an entrance song okay. please do yeah. <laughs> um i want to talk to you a little bit about the pirates organization you know you, you've been you were there for 10 years minors and major leagues included how, how do you look back on those years with that organization? Because as you know, being with different ones now, you know, they do things a little bit differently. So how do you view them now that you've been around the league a little bit? I really, uh, there's some people I met there that I developed great friendships with, some people that changed my life and my career. Uh, Clint Hurdle, getting to know him and having him as a leader and a mentor really helped me out. He was always there for me. Uh, any, anytime I needed anything or I just needed somebody to talk to, he gave me my first opportunity in the major leagues, which I'll never forget. So he was a, a guy that, uh, I mean, I can't say enough good things about. Teammates, I had a, huge, a couple of great teammates. I, I looked the other day and the teammate I've had the most in my career, the most years I've played with any single person uh, in the major leagues is Andrew McCutcheon. So I, I got wow. to see his whole like rise to stardom up through the minor leagues and in the major leagues of the Pirates. Then I played with him last season with the Phillies and he's still the same cut, crushing balls and He's really good. Um, but uh, in terms of the minor leagues with the Pirates, it was different. It was definitely different. And I, I went through a couple changes. When I first got drafted, uh, the GM and the farm director and everybody got switched out for a new GM and farm director. And they were very strict. And it was a, like definitely a uh, like professional type mindset when you were over there. I'm sure you remember that. Right? Yeah. A yeah. bit of military and it style. Was, it was definitely military style. Yeah. And I, I, I understood that. And I think I fit in okay because I'm a pretty serious dude and I love to take care of my work and I run hard and I take notes and I, I kind of fit into that. But at the same time, I was, when I left that organization, uh, I definitely was able to figure out who I was a little bit better. Uh, because when I got to Milwaukee, it was just a completely different atmosphere. And I'm not saying either one is better. I'm just yeah. saying it was different to where I was able to understand, okay, Oh, okay. I can ease up a little bit on the strictness and I can kind of be myself. And that helped me out a lot, I think. And in, in, in the end run, long run, I think that helped me out a lot. I think some structure helps some guys being who you, who you want to be helps other guys being who I wanted to be really did help me. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. And actually quick yeah. Clint Hurdle story for me. I was uh, in high A in Bradenton and I made the all-star team the year I was there in 2011. I never thought I'd have this happen. He's the big league coach at the time. He actually called me the day that I was a minor league all-star and said, congratulations, you know, great job, keep it up or whatever. Hopefully we'll see you soon. I was blown away. I was like, no way the big yeah. league manager cares about me and a ball right now. Like it was, it was pretty cool. So I'll always remember Clint Hurdle for that too. You incredible character, yeah. man of incredible character, no yeah. doubt. 
Um, at, do you remember uh, when we were at the Pirates? You know, they had, we had Pirate City, which is this like dorm, you know, like situation. Um, do you remember yep. our our dunking on the mini hoop videos that you used to make? Dude, <laughs> I've still got one of those. I might try to share it. Uh, I still have one of those dunking videos. We would like sl- we would like do crazy dunks with yeah. like a little foam ball on a Nerf hoop, and we would like do like three sixties between the legs, and we'd have competitions, right? We'd like yeah. judge it. Yeah. yeah. Dude, it those was kind of like those a, the days. an NBA bubble situation for us. That was what we were doing, basically. Dude, yeah, it was it was kind of it was a depressing place to be because <laughs> like we couldn't escape. If you right. didn't have a car, you literally couldn't escape. And you were a man. You were in your mid twenties, right? And you were kind of stuck in this bubble. Yeah, uh, it, it was great to be able to play baseball. Don't get me wrong about that. Right. Uh, but being unable to leave a dorm because you didn't have a car and it was just tough. And the curfew and every, yeah. Yeah. Hard. And the curfew. Yeah. And they would kind of like, I think they would track your key card, oh, yeah. see if you came in or not. Yeah. That's tough in your mid twenties. <laughs> it's tough. But, uh, but the dunk competitions made it all worth it, man. That oh, was it's fun. great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to fast forward back to 2011 when you actually got called up to the big leagues. What do you remember about, I, I guess, the first day or how you found out you got called up and then that first year as a rookie, you know, or, you know, the, the months that you played toward that end of that season? I remember uh, 2011 being like beside myself, un- un- unbelievable, like uh, almost like euphoric, couldn't, uh, couldn't believe that I was in the major leagues uh, and that I was able to play against guys that I've been watching on TV. I thought it was cool. And then I realized I kind of could hang because uh, they weren't as good as TV made them seem like they were right. until, uh, until my last second, to last outing or last outing, I was facing the Brewers and Prince Fielder was batting and he already had two home runs that day. The domes closed. They're going to playoffs. Their atmosphere is incredible. It's a sellout. And I throw a slider towards his back foot. It doesn't get there. And he hits a 315 foot home run down the line but it's his third of the day. He gets a curtain call and my ears are, are hurting because it's so loud. And still to this day, that's the loudest it's ever been at a game. Wow. Yeah. The first, my first month in the big leagues, it never, well, maybe the wild card games got that loud, but it, with the dome, it just makes it different because it echoes off the dome. Right. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. The Brewers, when they were in the playoff hunt, they had, they get some good fans there for sure. And you end up playing there too. Yeah. Then I played there later on and yeah. it's still, whenever that dome is closed, it gets crazy loud. Oh yeah. And speaking of that, so you actually, did you feel like you went to Milwaukee and then you end up signing a two-year deal with uh, Cincinnati, sorry, the, the following year, and you, did you feel like one of those is going to be like a temporary home for you? Yeah, man, as a middle relief righty, you tell, you, you, it's hard. talking about homes, you just have to take every day one at a time and go out there and just enjoy it because you never know when it could all be done. Because uh, you, you can't, you can control yourself and the work you put in and the structure and the, and the, uh, like the preparation, but you, you can't control the results. So, and a lot of times your, your job is determined on re- results. So I didn't, I, the yeah, essence I saw as home, but I also saw as like every day I showed up to the field, I was lucky to be on the team. Right. No, yeah. I totally get that. And that's a different mindset. Um, sometimes I've talked to other pitchers about the difference between starting and relieving in different mindset. There's less structure. It's more like you got to get, you, you got a chance to pitch every day almost. How did you start sure. to embrace that and get yourself into that mindset versus a starting pitcher who's got all the structure? Yeah, that was, I think that had to do with like the sprinting in the, the same right. type of thing. Cause as a relief pitcher, you're more like a, uh, sorry, I have a, a battery warning on my phone. You still there? Okay. Yeah. You might have to yeah. plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have done that before. <laughs> sorry. But as a, as a relief pitcher, you're just like every day you might go. So like, I just kind of, thought about it like I was some sort of a uh, like a position player and I just like every day I show up to the field I'm ready to go okay yeah there's never a day I won't pitch even if I've right. thrown two three days in a row there's still a chance like I threw the last three days before today today I stole my cleats on my glove ready in case some crazy thing happened and I was available again uh, you never know. especially now this season who know? I mean it's all crazy yeah. um yep. how's it by the way before we get to anything else how has it been so far with the, how this season has gone like just the travel and just the, the craziness of COVID and all that stuff. This season has been extremely uh, difficult emotionally to handle. It's been great baseball wise being a, having a chance to play this beautiful game. I can't complain about that, but not being near my family, having feeling separated from them because uh, they can't really travel because I've got little kids and, and it's the, the, the pandemic and it's just like, it's, it's tough because if they come then they have to bubble with me. But then if I go on the road, then they have to stay bubbled. 
so it's just like it's like why even come when they can be at home where it's like safe and they're you know have the routine right but, uh, so so i haven't seen my my wife and kids in 60 days it's a long time is, if you're used to that yeah it's i mean it's it's tough and it's because i want to play a game even though of course it's my job it's just hard for me to handle right i i can see how that could get tough but well, you know, we have technology, so at least you get a little bit of, you know, Zoom. FaceTime. And, you know, FaceTime, yeah. Yeah, that's, cool. yeah, that's true. That's true. But when I left, my daughter was barely saying words, and now she can string two words together. Uh, so it's just like I'm missing these stages in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely – we can switch the subject to something yeah. more positive and happy. <laughs> okay. But okay. baseball is great. Uh, but the behind the scenes of this season is very difficult. Okay. Totally get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. at the beginning and, of the year, and oh. I, and I had COVID man, which is brutal. Know. I don't know if you knew oh, that. Man. Yeah. I did not know that. How long yeah, did it take? I, Are you still lingering issues or did you get over it in a couple no, weeks? No, it, it was probably two weeks of really bad, really bad symptoms. It was tough. But then, uh, but then within a month I felt a hundred, like totally good, oh, wow. but it was, yeah, it was not like I, I immediately left my house to go to New York and two days later I had COVID. <laughs> yeah. So it was tough, wow. but now I have the, now I have the antibodies. So right, I hopefully exactly. don't, don't get it again, but right. there's no real proof, but all right, let's switch it to something more positive. Okay. You got it. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, well, in the beginning of the year, you were going to be with Houston and then all of a sudden COVID hits and then you're kind of in limbo. Yeah. And before you go to New York, you start making a lot of these pitching videos. It's what I, and I follow you on Twitter, uh, by the way, at locate Jared, if you want to follow, he's a great follow. Some of the best funny yeah. videos you've ever seen. Um, but you really got into the physics and the science of pitching. And I think you had met somebody, I forget his name, but that kind of introduced you to the, that kind of the side of baseball. And you started making these videos showing different movement of the ball and release points and all that stuff. Can you kind of go into what went into that during quarantine? You're not even sure what team you're going to be on, but you're making these videos that are kind of related to pitching. Yeah. So when I went, like I've, I've bounced around, I've gotten all these different teams, philosophies on pitching and what I need to do to improve. And it kind of got to the point where I was like, all right, I understand the movement I need to have on the ball when it's, need, when it's successful. So how do I repeat that movement? And the, the break, the postponement gave me time to like figure out how to repeat the good movement. And what I did was I took the info from the Phillies and the, uh, and the Astros that I knew I needed to do to succeed. And I, uh, I, I met up with a guy named Barton Smith on a Zoom call, not unlike this call right, where he was going over how baseballs move uh, because of their seams. And he said there's certain pitches that move extra because the way the seams are oriented on the top and the bottom of the ball, uh, they, they create extra drag and the, and the ball moves. He, he calls it seam-shifted wake. Okay. And, he, and he kind of determined that my sinker was one of those pitches, and when it's good, it has more. So he, then, then basically I threw 30 bullpens trying to figure out how to get that consistently on my sinker. And I've thrown some of the biggest sinkers of my life this year. The ones that have moved the most that I've ever, ever thrown in my career. Uh, probably my top 10 sinkers have all come this year, but I've thrown some bad ones too. So I need to get them more consistent. <laughs> but same grip that you used to have, you didn't change your grip? No, if I had a baseball, That's hold right. on, I'm going to go, <laughs> let's see. I might have one here. Hold on okay. one second. I don't go, I don't, I don't go anywhere without it. Let's see where sure. it is. Yeah. Different, all sorts of different grips, uh, but I, I slowly kind of creeped up to the top of the ball and gripped it like that. That's uh, almost like where a it was split. Almost, almost, but a split is deeper. A split right, is a right. little deeper, yeah. so it wasn't quite there. And it, it was hard and it had fastball spin, but it wasn't consistently good. So I had to, I, t I tinkered with all sorts of grips, like one finger on, one finger off, three fingers, and I did all these different things. But it seems like... Uh, it seems like that my, my best grip is somewhere in the middle of a traditional sinker grip. Okay. But the, the finger pressure, how my fingers leave the seams, where my thumbs at, it all really matters. And if it's a little off, the ball might not be oriented the right way. And it might wind up being off at home plate. Okay. So then so, how, how did that affect? Because you're a sinker slider guy. So when you're throwing your slider, did you change that at all? Or did you just look deeper into the movement of a slider? All I tried to do is increase the, infic the efficiency of my slider. That was pretty easy. I did it. Okay. I just, that was, that was like, and that basically means instead of letting it like rotate like a bullet, you know, I just kind of got around it a little more to make it rotate like a, like a sideways curveball. Okay. And it's, I've had success with it so far. It's, it's performing well. I need to throw it more probably. Okay. That's good. It's a good, yeah. it's a good out pitch usually, right? Especially, you know, righties and 
you know, back foot lefties or whatever. Not, you know, not that I'm giving away yeah. stuff here, but <laughs> no, well, that's no, you yeah, can literally yeah, go on yeah. baseball savant and see yeah. like every single hot zone right. I throw. And I, okay. but I can throw any pitch, any place if it had, if the, if the batter determines it's necessary. Okay. So yeah. now in the age of analytics and there's so much information and all the craziness, how do you separate, you know, the old school, I'm just going to go with what I got and here is me against you. And it's my stuff is what it is. Or, or how much do you, do you lean more toward the, physics and science of pitching now i lean way more towards uh being prepared and executing my plan so in in terms of preparing it's not in terms of the physics of baseball like yeah when you're out there it's hard to think about like your how you're yeah, you moving don't want that yeah. yeah no you need to be executing and sure you can tinker with your grip a little bit if you feel like one came off wrong but for the most part you need to be executing uh in in the major leagues if you don't if you don't hit your spots you're gonna oh, not okay. have success yeah. And especially so, as a reliever, you're only yeah. in there for maybe an inning or even a hitter right. sometimes. So you got to be dialed in when you get out there already. Not a hitter anymore. Oh, Brett. that's right. That's right. Three, Three hitters. Right. I'm, yeah. getting, <laughs> I'm younger than you, but I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's How, has that been weird for you? I mean, you know, no, I it's, like it. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. It's really the same exact thing. Yeah. Can you see me? Am I here? Yeah. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. 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 It's the same. It's the same exact thing. It hasn't really changed much at all. It's, uh, I, I think that, you have to understand if you say that you're up, like you're available to pitch, if they ask, sorry, is my phone going in and out here? It's going a little bit. Yeah. Okay. If that happens again, I'll try to, I'll try to fix it. But the, uh, if basically the, the, what are we talking about? Oh, we're talking the about three the hitters. Three, yeah. Yeah. So it's the same thing. If I can't go because I don't think I, I can face three hitters, then I have to tell them I can't go because I can't face three hitters. So before the game, you should know whether or not, it's going to be an yeah. issue and it's typically not an issue, at least not so far. And especially yeah. with like the lefty specialists, like, I'm sorry, they came up in the minor leagues, they can get right-handed hitters out, you know? And it's, yeah. I don't like the, the come in for one pitch as a, I'm watching as a fan now, it just takes forever. So I, I don't mind that rule. Yeah, I agree. I, I think so too. I, it, it kind of bummed me out at first. I would prefer just be everything be normal. Give me a free market where baseball is just baseball right. and I'll be a happy guy. But uh, but at the same time, I mean, this stuff isn't really affecting it that much. Not 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 so far, I, I think. What do you think yeah, about the, the the extra inning rule with the man on second? Yeah, I I don't love it. Yeah, honestly, yeah, I feel like it uh, it definitely alters the outcomes of games in a way that makes baseball much much different than it ever was before. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I bet, and you get almost like you give up a leadoff double, and now it's like, okay, nobody helped man on second. You know, it's it's tough. Exactly, exactly. It's not. It's not. I just I don't I don't like it because yeah. you put somebody on second with nobody out, and the percentage chance of that run scoring is already what uh, I forget the exact number. It probably depends on the hitter, but it's around right. fifty. Right. So it's not good. Yeah, I can imagine yeah. that being tough. Um, yeah. I did see somewhere. I think you're the you you're um. I guess makeshift catcher, you named him Rod Barajas. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. The former big league catcher. That's right. Yeah. My makeshift, my, my backyard catcher was Rod Barajas. And then he popped because I threw a fastball and he couldn't handle it. So the, 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 like the dummy deflated. (laughs) And then I had to get, I had to get a net and I pasted Tucker Barnhart's photo to it. And that was, uh, yeah, that was my new catcher. That's cool. So, but Hey, I did learn that throwing into nets is really not too bad. Because you really focus, you just try to hit that one spot on the net. Yeah. And sometimes in games, sometimes in games, you're just like, you don't need to hit the catcher right on. You can go, you can go a little at the catcher's mask, or you can go in off the plate in that daylight between the catcher and the hitter. And right. it, it's, you don't always have to throw right to the glove. Right. So, yeah. Well, I guess nowadays with a lot of relievers throwing in the upper 90s, what's it like, you know, being, I guess, an old school pitcher still, you know, like, you know, not everybody can throw a hundred, dude, you know, dude, I'm not an old school pitcher. You get, you get me wrong. Um, <laughs> not, that, not, uh, I mean, old yeah. school. I mean like not a, you know, no, I don't, plane thrower. I, yeah. Right. I don't throw a hundred. I get right. that. I'm not right. your typical guy, but in terms of, uh, analyzing the, the numbers, like if you see me here, I, I I'm not going to show you because yeah. I'm in my hotel room, but I've got like my computer, my iPad, I've been doing scouting reports for the last two hours. Every, se- every new series, I do at least three hours of scouting reports. Then I have to memorize them all. So every single hitter in the opposing lineup, I know exactly where to throw every one of my pitches. Uh, and that's like, that's new school, I think. I think that's like the new Dude, age. That's awesome. I, that's I love like, that. You're yeah. more prepared than just coming in and trying to throw. You're pitching. You are learning exactly. tendencies. You, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 
and and when I and when and when the when I'm out there, I'm not over. I'm, it's just like okay, I speak this language. I understand what this hitter's trying to do. I understand what he's done against me in the past. What he's done against guys like me. So I'm going to develop my plan based on what I know he's trying to do and my strengths, which yeah, are good. Yeah. 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 I think if, if Jamie Moyer and Greg Maddox have taught us anything, you don't have to throw a hundred to get people out. <laughs> truth. Yeah. Truth. Right? And sometimes 90 with a little bit with the seams the right way, like Barton it's harder says, to hit. Yeah, exactly. If you get the, if you get 90 with good seam, with good seam shift awake, you might be in more business than someone who's at a hundred, but it's just basic. I basic. Agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, going to your, uh, as far as your social media, when did you really start getting into posting funny videos and just random stuff happening to you on the mound in games? Like I saw the one with the Mets <laughs> recently with your, the new balances in the air or whatever. So I just, yeah. When did you start really getting into that? Yeah. I just, you know, I, I like, I like connecting with people when I, when the postponement hit, I was, I was super bored at home. Just, you know, like I was bored. I was with a fan. It was, it was fun. We we're having a good time. But at the same time, I missed baseball and I needed baseball content. Yeah. So I created baseball content. Now I realize there's a big market of people that want to see me being ridiculous. So I throw that out there at them, me doing ridiculous things. For sure. And it's, it's yeah. hilarious. If you, like, once again, you guys should all go follow Jared. Um, as far as pitching in New York now for the Mets, what's it, you know, they're really engaged. Sometimes I, I go through your comments and it's all like Mets, like they're hardcore. So what's it been like pitching in New York for the Mets and not, I guess, the Yankees, which are, you know, the star team of the, of the city? Wow, I guess I would disagree with that last comment. There you go. Is, yeah, I think the Mets are the star team of the city. Okay, okay. And pitching for the Mets is great. And the, the thing I've noticed about the fan base is they love the Mets. Like, it's like a love. It's not uh, – it's not – and they rarely get angry. I feel like it's, it's like uh, they get frustrated with us and they want to see us perform better. But they always want – like, every day there's a new game. They believe in us and we believe in us. And I think that's – something special and it's why it's going to be so sweet when we win because we understand how much faith the fan base has can you feel a difference being a west coast guy pitching on the east coast and just the intensity of the fans or at least the maybe the knowledge of the fans do you feel that at all no i think knowledgeable fans come across the country in all parts it, you can now certainly because you can watch baseball on tv people know a lot about the game and you yeah. get all the all the information on the internet right but i think that uh you can feel the difference east coast West Coast, man, yeah. no, no, you can't because Dodger Stadium's crazy sometimes, right, right? And the City Field is crazy sometimes. So I, I think it just depends on winning. When a team is good and a team is winning, the atmosphere is awesome. So that's why we're all trying to win, right? Because right. we want to, we want to win for our cities, right? And yeah. speaking of other stadiums, you know, so far, I guess in your career, where has been your favorite place to pitch, whether it's on the road or at home or whatever? What's your favorite stadium? For sure, uh, it's going to be uh, PNC because it's beautiful, but also San Francisco is amazing because it's at sea level, it's humid, it's cold, and the wind blows in a little bit. And if you, I mean, you're, I'm telling you, you could just go, I'm going to throw all high changeups tonight in San Francisco, and those things are just going to get hit dead rockets to center and caught. So I think for a pitcher, San Francisco is incredible. It's a lot like Blair Field at nighttime, right? It's exactly. And yeah. something I've learned is that when it's cold, the ball doesn't travel as far when it's cold and humid. Yeah, you're in business. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I wanted to ask you finally about, um, I saw an interview with you talking about how you have a journal that you use all the time. Is that still something right. you do and kind of what do you use it for that helps you prepare or stay on track with your daily routine? So I use the journal to learn if there's any, ever any lessons that I, that I need to remember because they like, I failed and I, it was the reason I failed or I had success and it was the reason I had success. I'll write that down and then I'll just write down my daily routine, just what I need to do and I'll check it off. So when I get out to the bullpen the other day, I forgot my glove, forgot my glove. Right. Yeah. And the phone rang in the second inning and they were like, so-and-so get going. It wasn't me. Thank goodness. Ooh. And I had time to run back in and get my glove. So now I have to start writing. Remember your glove on the, <laughs> on the list. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I mean, there's, a, there's yeah. a lot of stuff to remember, you know, so it's, it's tough. There is. No, man, there's so much stuff to remember. Yeah. Like it's, if you can, cause you, once you go out to the bullpen, there's no coming back. So you gotta, you gotta remember everything. That's a long way in, especially from the outfield too. Yeah. And there's yeah. just like the phone could ring at any time. And if you're not out there and the phone rings, you're not doing your job. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, being, you know, I guess what's it been like, I guess, you know, I don't know if you're the one of the older guys on the team, but yeah, I would assume you are. Do, have you taken on a different role since you are one of the a veteran in the league? 
Yeah, I, I, some of the teams I've been on, I've been I've been older than I am on this team, which has like a bunch of dudes with like 15, 12, 10 years of major league service time. So I'm kind of just like, kind of feel like a rook again. There but you I, go. I, Good feeling. I, I am the. I am the oldest guy in the bullpen. The one thing that I've noticed the game is making a change is that age and experience don't matter as much in terms of how you treat people. And that's the way it should be. It shouldn't matter, right? It shouldn't matter that I'm older. It shouldn't matter that anybody's younger, has less service time. We're all out there trying to achieve the same goal, trying to do the same thing. And we're all, you know, doing our parts. So if you treat anybody differently, you're making the team function less well. It, that's my opinion. That's how the game is going. And young players are super valuable right now. You see them across the league changing the landscape of baseball. And I think that's because a lot of teams are showing them how appreciated they are. And uh, if you can get the most out of your young players, it's a really good thing. No, I totally agree with that. Hey, man, I'm rooting for you as much as I can. It's great to see you, yeah. you know, still pitching and you're out there. You're doing great. Like, it's awesome. So, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Man, we're all I'm rooting glad for to be you here. back it's, here. <laughs> yeah thank you I, I, yeah. I got in a lot this week hopefully I can keep pitching a bunch I love it every chance I have an opportunity to do it I uh I miss playing with you though dude I miss those yeah. days those are fun I at know. Pirate City Pirate. trapped in the dorm <laughs> dunk competitions I've got it on YouTube it's a private video I'll make it public and share it with you you'll have exactly and you'll have to you'll have to share our episodes we can get all the, the good Mets fans to come and comment on them. oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah I'm sure they're all they, they, they as, I got to do something goofy if they want to see they're, they're gonna right. watch they That's want to see right. me fall down there you go <laughs> well Jared I appreciate it man it's been awesome thank you for coming to the show and uh definitely hope to see you soon in the off season if you guys ever come to, to SoCal for sure I'll let you know yeah I'm thinking about heading out there so I'll let okay. you know Sounds Thanks good. Thanks for having me on, Brett. Got it. Thanks. Man, if you didn't enjoy that, I don't know what you will enjoy because that was a great episode. Hope you got a lot of laughs out of that. Jared's awesome. He's a funny guy. Uh, glad to have him on the show. Um, thanks again for listening at Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can find me everywhere. Apple, YouTube, Spotify, you name it. Social media on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Find me anywhere. Two Tall Sports Podcast. Hope you enjoy. Please share with your friends and family. That'd be awesome. And just introduce them to the show. I think if they're into sports and they want to hear some of the behind the scenes stuff, I think, uh, you know, most sports fans would like to hear the stuff that you don't get to see on TV. So please pass it along. Um, you can ask me for the links. If you want, send me a DM, send me an email um, to tall sports podcast. Great to have you guys here to listen. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. And we'll see you again next week for another episode.